or Babel, is another one of those crazy weird things. Because if I was not a believer, if I didn't take the Bible literally, of all the stories in the Bible, this one sounds the most like mythology. What is mythology designed to do? Mythology is designed to explain something in the natural using a supernatural method. Well, that, that's, that's, you know, if I, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd say, uh, yeah, a bunch of people were building a big tower and God got angry because like, hey, I don't like big towers. Uh, if I'm flying by, I might hit it or something. So uh, you guys, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you guys Chinese and I'm going to make you guys African Americans. Oh, wait a minute. There weren't African Americans back then, were there? Guess he wasn't PC. I'm going to make you guys not white. I'm going to make you guys Caucasians. I'm going to make you guys Hispanics. I'm going to make you guys... You know, you didn't, it, it's to me, you know, if, if, if I was not a Christian and I heard that story, I'd be like, well, that's just the way that they explain the races to everybody. And so we got, we got to kind of probe into this and, and look up. Uh, a little more in depth into what it says and, and basically talk about why God disbanded these people. And uh, it wasn't because of the tower. It wasn't because of the tower. So let's take a look at this. Number one. There was a time when the world was unified and spoke one language. A couple of years ago, I came across uh, an archaeological article that I had preserved. I clipped it because of its significance. And this week, I went crazy looking for that article, and I could not find it. And I don't like to, I don't like to represent something without documentation. But I, I still, I know I've got it somewhere. I just don't know where I put it. So, um, so we... We, 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 we were reading about the Tower of Babel, and, and I was reading in a magazine, in a biblical archaeology magazine, and they were doing some excavations in the Middle East, uh, in the area of, of, of where Mesopotamia was, in the area of where, where Babylon used to be, and they found a stone tablet that talked about a certain king, and... Uh, in that stone tablet, it was it was from it was from a couple thousand years BC. In that stone tablet, it's it talked about this king, and it paused and it said he reigned when the people were of one language. And then it went on and, and it, it talked about a lot of it talked about all the horses and the cows and the sheep that he had. It was kind of insignificant from that point on. But that one little aside that they had in this thing that shocked the archaeologists that found it and, and really was impressive to the scholars that found it was that this tablet acknowledged a time when the people were of one language. And we begin this story, we begin this story as we look at the Tower of Babylon with that very same sentence in Genesis 11.1. 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they came, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Now this is amazing. <clears throat> they found a plain. The Wright brothers hadn't even invented <laughs> aircraft. <laughs> okay, maybe this is a different kind of plane. But they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. See? See? That's how good they were. They wanted to bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone. They had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens... Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now I'm going to stop here because I think there's some interesting things here. One, the people are unified. Everybody speaks the same language. Have you ever hung out with somebody who doesn't speak your language? 
not a lot of fun. When I was, uh, when I was in high school, we had two foreign exchange students. And, and uh, <laughs> actually, we, we had a kid that came from Mexico, and he stayed with his family. And they couldn't understand what, a word that he said, so they got another kid from Spain to come so that they both spoke Spanish and so they could talk to each other. And uh, they, they went to our church, and, and one, day, uh, one day they came over to the house for lunch, and, and while Mom and Dad and, and this couple were having lunch, uh, they sent us boys downstairs. So I'm downstairs with Marcos and Hector. And uh, I'm like, you know, the only thing Marcos can say is, Hi! And then he, he said that, hi, hi, you know. And uh, Hector was a little more fluent in English, but it was real broken English. I tell you what, I had one of the worst days of my life trying to communicate with those guys. And, and it was like, I had to speak real slow, and, and I said, now I want to go, huh, no comprende, uh, okay, well, I'll let, but when they talked to each other, they were like, you know, really fast, and, and uh, always made me nervous when they laugh and you know point at me, but um, <laughs> but the, I, I, I know the barrier of having been in a place where somebody speaks a different language. It, it slows things down. You can't communicate things. You can't uh, uh, you can't talk the way that you need to talk. And and boy, if, if you want to be advanced in your work today, learn some Spanish. Because they'll make you a foreman on the job so that you can communicate with the workers. But the truth is, if we can't communicate, if we can't communicate, the, there's a language barrier. And this is a barrier these people didn't have. They spoke one language. They were unified. There was no, there was no other culture. Because we speak the same language, but we all come from different cultures. So I might say something to you, and it might be perceived differently than my intentions because of your cultural background. So even speaking the same language, having different cultures, it throws a wrench in the things that we do. But these people spoke the same language, and they had the same culture. So there was a complete unification of thought. There was a clarification of communication. And when they, when they spoke and when they planned, they were all focused on the same thing. And that's why they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Now, scholars debate over this because of the way it's worded in the Hebrew. Some say it means that the top of the tower is up to the heavens. Others say it means that they put the heavens up at the top of the tower. You're saying, What? Well, at this time, they were into astrology. And they would watch the rotation of the stars, and they would watch the rotation of the sun and the moon. Now, I believe that the, the, the Tower of Babylon, and most scholars believe it was a zuggernaut. Everybody say zuggernaut. 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 Now, if you ever get mad at anybody and you don't want to swear at them, just call them a zuggernaut. But I believe that it was a zuggernaut, which is, is kind of like a pyramid, but it's layered. It's got one layer and then maybe another layer and another layer. If, if it was building up to the heavens, it would actually be huge at the foundation. But the, the other thing that scholars believe is that because they worshipped astrology and because they worshipped, they were building in a specific place where at the top they would put an observatory where they would observe the stars and they would observe the movements of the sun and the moon. And, and now this, this gives credence to the fact that if you study some of the pyramids and the zuggernauts that have been built by different cultures that are in existence today, they're all aligned with certain celestial beings. But it's the Great Pyramid of Giza uh, that, 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 that aligns itself with, uh, with the different stars in the heavens, whether it's Draconis or whether it's the Pleiades. But uh, also, if you look at Mayan culture and Aztec culture, a lot of their great buildings were basically built along the lines of the celestial bodies of the stars. They studied all this stuff. And so at this time, uh, it could have been not a huge tower that went all the way up to the heavens, but a huge tower in which they observed the heavens, that they used it for. 
But the gist of this isn't what kind of tower it was. It's what it was built for. They were making a monument to themselves. To themselves. They were making a monument to themselves. It was completely to say, hey, we're here. This was a generation that had come after the flood. So there's two things that they did. They wanted to build it high. had to be a tower. And they wanted to leave their mark on the earth. Because a lot of them were, well, if we get destroyed again, hey, at least this will say, here we were. So there's a lot of debate over what it was exactly, what the specific function was. But we just know they wanted to build something. They wanted to put something there that would serve as a monument itself. Number two, there's power in mass consciousness. And the scriptures even declare this. But we are not God-centered in our human nature. We are self-centered. There is power in mass consciousness. The scriptures declare this. We're about to read the next grouping of scriptures that comes after the, the grouping of scriptures we just read. And God himself says, hey, these people are of one mind. They're of one thought. Nothing will be withheld from them. That's the power of mass consciousness. When everybody's thinking the same thing, when everybody's, when everybody's putting out the same thing, a lot of times we don't we don't realize this because a lot of times we don't we don't like to we don't like to talk about this, but but there is substance to your words and there is substance to your thoughts. There's substance to that. There was a lady uh, a few years ago who wrote a book about being taken into heaven and being shown a bunch of different things by the Father. <clears throat> she was brought back down and she was taken into a little church, probably about the size of ours. And she saw people singing and praising God. And she said as they were singing, this green stuff was coming out of their mouths. <laughs> it wasn't like exorcist puke. It was, uh, it, it, was, it was this green vapor that was rising up to heaven. And, and she got this totally different concept of praise and worship. Because after she saw that, she said, worship is a substance. Our prayers are a substance. Where we focus our thoughts. I tell you, Job said, that which I have most greatly feared has come upon me. What you focus on is probably going to happen. Not that you're attracting it, but you're probably making it happen. Because it's your focus. So there is power in that, that, that human thought. Genesis 11, 4 through 6. It says, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed the people are one. They all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. There's a few things here that are, that are interesting. One is... Uh, the fact that this could be a representation of Christ that actually walked the earth and looked at this tower. Because God is all-knowing, right? He's like, oh, what's going on here? That shouldn't be occurring, but... At the same time, the representation of God has been throughout the Old Testament. A lot of times we don't, we don't realize it. But the Lord himself went to Abraham with a couple of angels. As a matter of fact, there's a line in the Bible, and when we get to that place, I'll point out the scripture. But there's a line in the scripture where it says, Then Yahweh from below looked as Yahweh from above rained fire down. You're like, how's Yahweh below and above? I believe that when the Lord was with Abraham, it was the physical manifestation of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus was the fourth man in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I believe that Jesus is the judge. He's the judge. See, the first time he came, he came as a lamb. But he holds the right for judgment. And when he comes back, he's coming back as a lion. He's coming back as a judge. And so here's here what I believe is that Jesus touched down and as judge 
He stood there and he looked at what they were doing. He stood there and looked at that city. He looked at those people. Now, part of God scattering these people isn't just because of their selfishness. And it's not just because of the fact that, uh, that, that God was frightened that they might come up to heaven and take over. No, that's not it. God has a plan for us. And we're in the final stages of that plan right now. Do you ever wonder why it took us so long to get here? Think about that. Think about this. A hundred years ago, we were riding horses. A hundred years ago, we were sending mail through Pony Express. A hundred years ago, we were not nearly advanced as we are right now. And our advances keep coming rapidly and rapidly and rapidly. And you look at it and you go, why did it take us all these years to go, hey, let's get technological. Let's start using science. I mean, some of the things you look at, you look at, uh, you look at Leonardo da Vinci's drawings. He drew an airplane. How come it took hundreds of years before anybody capitalized on that? There has been an unseen hand holding back our progress until the right time. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe part of this Tower of Babylon story is because man would have progressed if he hadn't have been confused. He would have began to he would have began to understand more of the sciences. He would have, and it would have been too soon. It would have been like giving a baby power tools. And if you don't believe that that's not a good idea, you got a baby, give him some power tools this afternoon. Plug him in for him. Before you do. <coughs> See what happens. So, so Yahweh scatters these people because of this. Number three. Yahweh confuses the language of the earthlings and scatters them throughout the land. Genesis chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of of the earth. Now, a lot of people say, well, this, 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 this cannot be. How can you go? Know, there's, there's difference. There's differences in, in races. But even, even somebody who's into science can tell you that our DNA shows that we all came from one common ancestor, regardless of our races. Now, the difference between what science and, and, and evolution believe compared to what our time period here does for us is the fact that we saw some different adaptations and changes take place rapidly. They didn't happen over hundreds of thousands of years. And, and we look at we look at things and we, we look at, for instance, skin color. Skin color isn't something that changes over hundreds of thousands of years. If you take an African American and a Caucasian and you marry them and they have children, they will have a child that's called a mulatto. Now that child will actually be kind of a, a most, as a matter of fact, some of the most beautiful people in the world. The most beautiful people, Holly Berry. I don't know Nicole I said that, but some of the most beautiful people. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that child, that child will be, will be brown skinned, the <coughs> They'll have some of the best features of, of both of the, of the genes from mom and dad. Here's the interesting thing. If you take two mulattoes, this, this is just second generation now. Take these two mulattoes, second generation, and you marry them, they could have a child 
that looks like Rebecca from Sunnybrook Farm, or they could have a child that looks like Nagunda from Kenya. Because they have the genetic soup that can go from all the way from, from, from a complete African look to a complete European Caucasian look. And it's, it's been, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's been cases, and this is documented, you can go online and look at it, it's weird stuff, but sometimes two white people have a black baby. Usually there's a story that the woman's not telling me how to no. <laughs> Sometimes because of the fact that there's, there's this thing in their genes. But it doesn't take, it doesn't take hundreds of thousands of years for us to make all kinds of different colored people. Only two or three generations. And the interesting thing is, some of the, some of the things that are different, some of the distinctions... As a matter of fact, Asian people, a lot of times people say, well, Asian people have squinty eyes. No, they don't. They do not. They have fat deposits around their eyes. And if Asian people live in different cultures, sometimes, after a few generations, some of those fat deposits will become less and less if they're in a different kind of climate, in a different atmosphere. Not over hundreds of thousands of years. And so one of, the th one of the interesting things is we can look and we can see that there's, there's some genetic differences in the races, but we all have a common ancestry. On that, even science and the scriptures can agree. So here's the thing. What about the language then? This is the tough thing to wrap your head around. How is it that they're all working together? One day they're like, hey, could you hand me that saw over there? Thank you, I appreciate that. I was just wondering... Hey, what's your, what's your mom doing this weekend? See, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to hire me now. What? See, I'm going to hire you now. See, I'm going to hire you now. You ain't making no sense. I'm going to call Foreman. Hey, John! You're not going to hire you now. See, I'm going to hire you now. You're not going to hire you now. We'll let you guys work this out by yourselves. Okay? I mean, you can imagine that's this is weird. Weird. You can imagine people freaking out. And people, and, and how did they get together? Because number one, if I start speaking a different language, I don't know what I'm saying. I know what I think I'm saying, but that's not really what I'm saying, is it? Or is it? Did they did they get together? Did it, did they say okay? I hope you guys understand this. I'm going to put a rock in the middle of the town. And everybody point to it and say what it is. If you hear somebody saying the same thing as you, you get with those people and then we'll all split and go somewhere else, okay? What's one state? I mean, I have a lot of questions when I'm reading through this. But the interesting thing is a linguist decided he wanted to find out where the English language came from and he traced it back to Europe and he traced the European languages back. He could trace them back about 3,000 years. And then he came to a dead spot. Where he couldn't figure out where it came from. Now, most evolutionists believe that language developed all over the world at the same time. And that so simultaneously... Language just developed all over the world, and all of a sudden, civilized people could all speak. But they all spoke different language. Now, think about this. Think about this, that randomly, at the same time, they're learning how to talk and write in China, and they're learning how to talk and write in Egypt, and they're learning how to talk and write... And they've all got these complex, complex languages, <coughs> and they just randomly happen to develop at the same time. That's as hard to believe as Babel. Because the one thing, one thing you know, every language that's in existence, and, and right now there's over 5,000 languages in existence on the face of the earth. Every single one of them have a complex syntax, which means they're not simple languages. As a matter of fact, they've taken kids who've been raised by wolves. You ever watch those Discovery Channels? She-Ra, the girl raised by wolves. And you're like, ooh, she's happy. 
She like all dirty. <laughs> when they take those kids in, some of them are teenagers. And take them out, they, they've been raised by dogs or wolves. They don't have a language. Animals don't have a language. They have songs and they have, they have ways of communicating. But have you ever seen animals having a conversation? We don't like those French cows. <laughs> Animals don't converse. If you've got a dog or a cat, you know that, you know, they maybe have, cats have one word, meow. They have one word. And they just use a different expression, like meow, meow. They got that and they got that. <laughs> that means back away, you're going to get scratched. Dogs are, whoa. You can't have a conversation if that's all you can say. Some mornings that's all I can say, but Nicole says you can't have a conversation with me. We speak a complex language, and it's unique to any other creature. And I believe language. And our writing is a gift from God. And I believe the author of the language that we speak and the author of what we have was wise enough to divide that, to cause that confusion, to send us off to these different places, to make different people groups. Because someday we're going to come together. Someday we're going to be one world! New world order. But guess what? It ain't going to be good. But he's not going to destroy our town. He's going to allow us to destroy ourselves. It's just going to be different. But now is the time. We're living in that time now. Now we're connected. Now we're coming together. And so, so you think about this. You think about God confusing the languages. Well, God did something really cool. Because God confused them about Babylon and sent them apart because of selfishness. Because they wanted to exalt themselves. They wanted to follow their will. If they would have, if they would have gone on, they would have, they would have achieved great things, but they would have destroyed themselves too. Because man is selfish. Man innately is not good. Man wants domination and power and destruction. And God knew that. And it wasn't the right time. But there was a time that was right. Number four. God restored our unity when we yielded our will to Him. God restored our unity when we yielded our will to Him. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Does this not mirror Genesis chapter 11, verse 1? They were of one mind. They were of one accord. They were in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now this is an amazing story because we know that the Feast of Pentecost was a big deal. And so there were thousands of Jews that were coming to town from all kinds of different places. Some of them were from Ethiopia and some of them were from Egypt and some of them were from uh, different regions of Asia. And they all spoke different languages and they all had different cultures. And as the Holy Spirit begins to fall, these Jews in this upper room begin to speak out and they have no idea what they're saying. But it says, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. And they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. 
Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? The very thing that God tore apart at the Tower of Babel on the day of Pentecost when those believers are yielded to him he begins to gather in he begins to gather in and they begin to speak with other languages in order to communicate to those down below God's entered the picture do you understand the advancements that have been made in our culture since the canon of the scripture has been completed. We've come a long way in just 2,000 years. Think about it. We have come a long way in 2,000 years. I mean, you think about Adam, and I believe Adam was intelligent. I don't think Adam was like, I don't have a quest for fire, Adam, in my head. But you think about Adam... He had, he had a horse, just like everybody else had a horse, if you know. That's it. That was his transportation. And transportation stayed that way for thousands and thousands of years. They were nomads for thousands and thousands of years. They didn't have a lot of luxuries. The civilization, civilization really began to take off at the time of Christ. That was the beginning of the Roman roads and the trade routes. It was the perfect time to come in and to take the gospel to all nations. And now the gospel's gone across the world. And today, we live in a technological society that is rapidly advancing towards the second coming of Christ. And the world is still speaking Babylon. God is speaking clearly. If you follow God, if you hold to Him during these times that we're coming into, He's going to take care of you and protect you. He's going to be the only thing that makes sense pretty soon in our society. But if you don't have Him, nothing's going to make sense. You're going to turn on the news and it's just going to seem like babble to you. Well, you'll understand what they're saying but you won't understand why these things are happening. God wants us to devote ourselves to Him so that He can work through us. Not to make a monument to self, but to build monuments to Him so that all men may glorify Him. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. God wants to restore us into unity, but not unity with one another, not unity in a worldly sense, but unity in a godly sense. Unity with Him so that we can be of one mind, one heart, and one spirit, not ours, but His. And if we do that, God's going to do great things through us. Let's bow our heads. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask a question this morning. My question is this. Are you in unity with the Father's heart? There's a lot of things you're probably trying to do. There might be struggles you're trying to face. Sometimes we face struggles because we're doing them in our own strength. Are you in unity with the Father's heart? What are you doing with your life? Are you building a tower to self? Are you working for things that you can't use? Taking time away from your family that... You can never get back? Are you doing things that seemingly no one appreciates? It's time to stop and it's time to say, God, I want to begin to do your will and not my will. Because my will comes to naught. My will comes to nothing. This morning, if you're building a tower to self, I challenge you to lay that down. I challenge you to say, Jesus, take my life and use it for your purpose and your glory. And if you say that, I want to warn you. He will. He will. 
lay your life down at the throne of God. And he'll restore you. Not in your image, but in his image. It's time to sacrifice some things in our lives for the sake of the kingdom. To quit building the towers to self. Quit building up our prestige and our names. And it's time to start building up the kingdom of God. Father, this morning I pray that you would challenge us, God. Help us to build your kingdom in our hearts and in our lives. Help us to seek you with all of our hearts. To find you, God. And to be unified with you. Bring restoration into your body, Lord. Not just this church, but churches across the land, Father. Restore, revive, refill, God. Renew. Father, I pray that you would help us to lay down our selfish ambition and to pick up that cross and to carry it so that others might see you glorified even in the midst of our suffering. May we bring you glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name.